Hey, so welcome to another episode of the Flow Tribe podcast. So in this episode, my guest is Daniel Goodenough. So I think the best way to introduce Daniel is to read a short bio from his website, thewayoftheheart.com. Daniel Goodenough brings a commitment to embody the human experience and its expression through art, science, and spirituality. He has worked as a scientist, a professional musician, a fine artist, and a designer. And he's had a lifelong commitment to the mystical path. He brings a depth of understanding to empower students of the way toward the fulfillment of their life mission. I think that last part really sums it up. After speaking with Daniel, it's very clear that his purpose in life is life mission and helping others find their life mission. We talk about that. We talk about what that means. We talk about what it means to have a vision for your life and how that brings in everyone else. Uh, we talk about purpose and how your purpose can evolve throughout your life to help you fulfill your life mission. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I felt like we, um, we had a lot of ideas that we shared, yet we kind of came at them from a slightly different perspective. And that's always what makes for interesting conversation. So I really enjoyed this conversation, and I'm pretty sure you will too. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Daniel Goodenough. So Daniel, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me. And so I would really like to start by maybe just having you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do. Um, thank you for having me on. I'm looking forward to the interview. Uh, who I am is somebody who's been, who's devoted the life to the question of why am I here? What does that call me to do? And who does that call me to be? And becoming, that's the first level of the life mission inquiry. Um, my journey was, if I'm going to talk to people about that, I, there were things I explored on the way. It, when I was young, especially when you get to that point where you're moving from high school to college, there's the occupational consultations and there's you, what I do for a living now, what was you wouldn't have found in a job category or a job catalog back then, right? So it, the journey has been about discovering since I knew as early as I can remember remembering that why I was here to help people remember why they're here and actually embody and step into that. So along the way, in a way of creating my own dreams, I, you know, I, logic of a 14 year old at 14, I decided, um, how can I become famous so people will listen to me when I talk about life mission, you know, logic of a 14 year old, right? And I thought, well, I'm too small for sports and too shy for acting, maybe music, because I was good at that. So I pursued music as a career and uh, also um, a fine arts degree. I got a fine arts degree and along the line pursued music and became a touring musician and did and recording artists and you know those sorts of things um, and then you know in the way of pursuing dreams that you know like art is something I enjoy music is something I enjoy I'm good at it but it wasn't my life mission per se though I've included it now um, and along the way I have functioned as a working scientist I've, um, I opened a design studio along the way. When I opened the design studio, that was specifically around the question of the economist Paul Pilsner was saying that uh, Nobel winning, prize winning economist saying that 90 to 95% of the jobs in the next 10 years will be jobs that don't exist right now. And uh, people mostly have to create them for themselves. So the idea that many people would be moving towards self-employment has become true. And my opening a design studio was along the lines of what's a business, what would be a business I could open that wouldn't drive me crazy. And I thought design would be cool. And so I parlayed my uh, fine arts degree into a design studio and did that until I was ready to take all of the, uh, prototyping and experimenting I was doing and move that to, okay, it's time to do this full time. So that uh, I started with a company that was called the International Success Institute, became a trainer for them. And then at a certain point, I co-founded The Way of the Heart with Kimberly Herkert and have been doing The Way of the Heart for 30-ish years, maybe a little, a little over 30 years, um, training people to remember why they're here and what that calls them to do and who that calls them to be and how to step into that 
and then how to manifest that artfully, beautifully, sacredly, and skillfully integrating art, science, and spirit. And finally, how do you scale that up in the world? And the scaling that up uh, manner in which I would call life mission for that fourth level of the life mission work has also given birth to how do we do that with entrepreneurs and corporations in that you really do have the sense that corporations are running the world and they've made a hot mess of it. So then, you know, my calling to work with corporations and entrepreneurs is how do we do that in a way that is in harmony with life in the future that wants to happen and how do we scale that up without figuring? So that means that uh, the work has been doing with individuals and with corporations and entrepreneurs and it's really founded on the idea of why are you here, what does that call you to do, and who does that call you to be, whether you're a person or a company or an, an enterprise or government for that matter. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, a few things that stood out to me with what you were saying, first of all, on your own mission, your own journey, rather. Yeah. You mentioned, first of all, music, and then also fine arts, and then eventually science. And I'd be really curious to know, as one individual who kind of followed this, um, what some people might think a very diverse path through life, what was the common thread, right? Because if we're talking about our own essence, I think there's usually an, an underlying foundation there. There's a common thread that can be found throughout our lives. And so I'd be curious to know your thoughts on that. Like, as you go from music to art to science, what is the common thread? What's the common energy there that allowed you to pursue those things along your journey? Sure, good question. Um, the common thread for me throughout my entire life has always been how do I help people remember why they're here and what that causes them to do and who that causes them to be in that conversation. And that's been a question, you know, that uh, one of the life mission scales is what's the question at the center of your life? You know, and it said that when Siddhartha Gautama Buddha woke up, it wasn't that he was looking to wake up, that was a side effect. He was all in on questions like, why do we get sick? Why do we grow old? Why do we die? And being all in on those questions woke him up. So I might say the way, capital W of Life Mission, is one of the paths for awakening. And it's the question at the center of my life and it's the thread that is, I've held that question for every, you know, my entire life. So as I mentioned earlier, the that is a way of living as a way of livelihood it wasn't in a job catalog anywhere and what and the whole personal growth personal development industry wasn't present then either when i started out as it as a young person so even personal growth personal development seminars podcasts like none of that existed then so the exploration of you know as i mentioned music was i'm going to become famous as a musician and then people will listen to me when i talk about life mission um, I had a scholarship to um, University of Madison to do Madison, Wisconsin to do art. So, you know, I did that because it was a vehicle and I thought also a vehicle to talk about life mission. And of course that uh, over, over the, over the um, evolution of the conversation about life mission, it, the, the evidence as a, that took me from art to science was that the integration is, the manner in which you do like your life mission is as important as whether you do your life mission. Because if you're, if you're doing your, even if you're doing your life mission, but the manner and the manner in which you're doing your life mission is, uh, let's say largely unconscious and largely without any kind of real awareness, I'm not sure that it's really better that you were doing it or not doing it if that's the case, right? So it became evident in the development of the work that uh, the integration of art, science, and spirit, or the good, the true, and the beautiful was important. And that's always been important to me personally, hence the music and the art. Um, and I've always had a, a strong um, bent towards wanting to know how does it work, and that's what science is. And the integration of art and science is, science says, here's how I work, whether that's a, the technique of art, you know, the how and the science of the art, or whether that's the why I should care about that, the spirit of the science. So science says, here's how it works, and whether that's technique or here's how classical science works, here's the, or here's how the universe works, you know, macro, micro. Um, 
and why should I care about that? So all of that's sort of been, you know, part of the uh, ongoing thread of uh, over the entire lifetime being present to the conversation about how do I help people get present to why they're here and why that's important and embody that and embody it artfully, beautifully, sacredly, and skillfully, the integration of art, science, and spirit. And then how do you scale that up in the world? You know, how did the second level is how do I do that in the way that I can personally make a livelihood? And at the fourth level, how do I scale that up in the way that it has impact in the world? So the thread has always been life mission that's had me investigate um, all kinds of different threads, uh, you know, the, in the weave of that, but th that's always been the golden thread is the life mission conversation. And I should say, you know, when you say, what is that? Um, my, my way of distinguishing what other people will collapse into vision, mission, and purpose, kind of like they're all the same thing, not to say that this is the correct way to identify those, just to say that when I'm talking about them, I would say that vision is what you see as possible for the world that a lot of people, a lot of other people might also be involved in. So I'm obviously not the only person talking about life mission. So I see it as a vision of possibility for the world that the world could take it as self-evident at some point that we're all here for a reason and that anytime anyone anywhere doesn't step into that, we all lose. And that somewhere on the planet, the problems at any given time throughout history have been, the answers to that have been present in the heart of the people that were present. And when people didn't step into their, the gift they brought to address that, the problem got passed to the next generation with added resonance. So the vision of, vision of possibility, like life mission, is something a lot of people are doing. Thankfully, that's great. Life mission is the unique way you come to that. What's your unique expression? So a lot of people are talking about li life mission. A lot of people are musicians. A lot of people are artists. A lot of people are scientists. A lot of people work with the financial realm and the political realm and the social realm. The particular way that you would you bring what you have to bring to that, and for that matter, the personal development realm and the healing realm, the particular way is your life mission. And that means that you bring a particular way of addressing your life mission to the vehicles that other people might also be expressing to those same vehicles. And then when it comes to purpose, that, you know, and vision and mission often get collapsed with purpose. What I noticed that purpose has a very temporary nature in general, as in sometimes your purpose is to get to the other side of the room. Sometimes your purpose is to finish your work so you have a free weekend. Sometimes your purpose is to connect to your friends and community um, for a picnic or a sporting event or a project. And when the project is done, maybe you connect with a different community. So there is a very uh, sort of temporary aspect to purpose. You know, and so, we, so when we say life purpose, I mean, it, it's kind of pointing to the whole thing, though generally how that gets expressed is my vision of possibility expressed in my unique way is now showing up like this as a, it, and purpose being more a project nature of that. So my purpose might be the next three months, that next three years aspect of my unique mission approach and the, my vision of possibility. So mission, vision, purpose. And so I say mission because it's the unique piece of how we approach vision. And then purpose is how we're gonna do that right now. Which for me at, very, at certain times was through art. It, sometimes it was through music. Sometimes it was through science. And now I do all of those at various times in the work I do with the life mission conversation. I do a, a music class that's done within the context of life mission. I do a, a class where everyone does every one of the visual and performing arts. And then we say, what's the science and spirit of that art? And then we do go to what's the art and spirit of science. And then we say, what's the art and spirit of, or art and science of spirit. And then we move at the end of the week to what's the art, science and spirit of medicine and healing and finances and politics and, and, and finding your life mission. So I incorporate all those things now. So everything gets used, but the main thread has always been life mission. So just to make sure I understand correctly, 
in those three levels, the vision, the life mission, and the purpose, the vision is this all encompassing vision, which includes other people. It includes your vision for the world, your vision for society, your vision for those things that are bigger than you. And then the life mission is really your own little, your own little path throughout that larger vision, right? How is it that you're going to contribute pers personally, your unique way of contributing to that larger all encompassing vision. And then your purpose would be the actions or the thoughts that go behind the, like you said, time. And that at that point can be very abstract. It could be in a moment, it could be in a longer period of time, but that purpose will evolve. That purpose will change throughout your life so that you're constantly feeding that foundation, which is the life mission, which mm -hmm. then goes on to feed the larger vision for the world and for society and all that. Does that make sense? It does. I would add to that, that, uh, Vision isn't just my vision. It's the vision of pos it is the vision of possibility I see for the world. The second part is that that a lot of other people might also be doing. Okay. Right. So okay. there's a collective vision of possibility for the world that that you're aligned with. Right. Absolutely. The level of vision. So it is my vision of possibility and recognizing. Hopefully, there's a correlation to a collective vision of possibility. Right. And then it, you and then your unique piece of that it's. It's like your fingerprint, you know, you're, that there are seven plus billion people in the world and yet your fingerprint is totally unique. Yeah. And as an artist, your voice is unique. And, you know, you say how many trillions of snowflakes fall on the planet in a given year, every one of them are unique. So the, your mission is the very unique, let's say blueprint of the way you would address the vision of possibility. Okay. And then um, purpose also includes action. You know, it is, you know, the abstract sort of uh, soul spirit, how I'm engaged in the immediate next three months, next three years, that sort of thing. Um, and it's also how is that, how that gets translated into the action for the vehicles of the, so the life mission, you know, it's my, in my experience, your life mission doesn't change throughout your entire lifetime. What does change are the vehicles through which you express it. So, and you know, I think Barbara Shear had a great way of talking about that, it's divers and scanners. There are people that will express their life mission through one thing throughout their entire life. And uh, there are certain domains which kind of call for that. They're becoming rarer and rarer. It, more common is the, what Barbara Shear would call scanners in which you might express the one life mission through multiple vehicles simultaneously. So as a scanner, you might be an artist and a politician and a author and a, you know, and a, and a, and a, right? And some people express their are scanners sequentially, that they go deeply into something for three years in terms of a vehicle, and then they express it through another vehicle for three years, and then another vehicle like that through their lifetime. So to say that, purpose is more a uh, nod to the way in which the vehicle of expression can be simultaneous and short term or sequential and short term. It's like the next three months to the next three years and how that gets translated into how I'm bringing it to the world, you know, which will include the mood, you know, like I say, there's the outer life mission and the inner life mission. The outer life mission is the why and what, why am I here and what does that call me to do? And the inner life image says, why am I here? And who does that call me to be? Yeah. And who will I become by doing the what? So that when you've done the what, it changes who you are. And because you change who you are, it changes what you'll do next. So the what changes the who and the who changes the what, and the what changes the who and it goes, and they're integral and cyclic, I suppose, in a fashion. So the inner and the outer life mission are integrated in that sense. And you might say that uh, the who you've become the inner life mission is the only thing you'll take with you when you leave the body suit. That makes sense. And then because who you are changed, how you bring it will be, will make, uh, evolve to a new vehicle. And it may be advanced to a new vehicle because of that. And because the world is radically changing, you know, that, uh, our current somewhat forced, movement towards moving to everyone moving to digital is a consequence of the COVID age. You know, we'd say that, you know, we had 
the, the, the letter generations, you know, the X generation and the Y and the Z generations, and, you know, conversations are now happening where they're saying, moving forward, we'll be talking about the COVID generation. Yeah. Right. So how the vehicle for the expression of our life mission for all of us um, is probably calling for a different vehicle for all of the way we bring it is going to change radically, probably. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I, I would argue though that the, I think the digital generation had started before COVID in many oh, yeah. ways, <laughs> but yeah. no, but I completely agree that um, I think COVID, what COVID has done is it's, it's kind of forced people into the digital. Uh, yeah. People who may not have embraced it before actually just don't have a choice. And I think that's where real societal change happens is when something happens such as this, where the choice is taken away, right? And that's going to accelerate many people into this new way of doing things that maybe would have been a lot slower to happen. Um, something that you mentioned early on and you've repeated a few times that I really want to get into is that you help people remember why they're here. And I think that um, I'd really like you to maybe explain that because I think for a lot of people that might seem, well, how do I remember if I already, I'm here? Why should I remember why? Um, and I have some ideas about what that might mean, but I'd love to hear obviously what you mean by that. Well, the first part about it is it isn't something you're creating now. It isn't like you came in as a blank slate and now let's uh, figure out why, what I can do now that's meaningful. It's said, you know, one of the reasons I also say mission is it implies being sent. There's a, there's a Rumi poem that says, it's as if he, a king has sent you to a foreign land and you do 10,000 things, but not the one thing you were sent for. It's as if you've done nothing. You know, that it's as if you've done nothing, but it's a little harsh. I don't know if I agree with that, but to say that we, the, that it, one of the ways that the mystics talk about, it, it's written in your members, that your predisposition to be interested in certain things that other people are not for the world interested at all. What motivates you, what uh, captivates you, what fascinates you, what you have a predisposition to do, what was packed in your bag, so to speak. I like to, you know, I was one of those kids who went to summer school or uh, summer camp, you know, and I know there was music camps and debate camps and you know, different kinds of camps. And if you went to music camp, you had instruments and music packed in your bags. If you went to sports camp, you had athletic stuff packed in your bags. When you come to earth camp, depending on you know, what you're meant to do here, different things were packed in your bags and they were packed. They were written in your members and it's not an accident. So it's not that you're, you, it's not about inventing something that's meaningful to you now. You're, there's a part of you that has always already known why you're here and so it's about remembering not to forget to remember not to forget that uh, there's a certain line of research that said most of us somewhere between the age of six and eight knew why we were here. It has, partially it has something to do with brain development that our brain is developed enough that we can kind of get a sense of how everything is working here and who we are and you know obviously the brain doesn't really complete until 20 something but you, if there's a kind of point where you've been here long enough to kind of figure out how it goes, long enough to see what's up now on the planet now that you were born into and your brain is developed enough that research has, has shown that by and large, most people, unless they've been severely traumatized, which some of us have been, um, do know why we were here and then we get talked out of it. And because we have a culture that, and we have, we have an educational system that was designed for the industrial age, in which you were being taught to be a cog in the wheel, you know, and we've left, we're now, we went past the industrial age into the information age, into the contact stage, into the imagination age. You know, some people are talking about it as society 5.0 or the imaginal age. Like that educational system is not adequate to the time we live in, in that it wasn't real. It wasn't trained to teach us to be present to a conversation about why we were here. So, by and large, because you were discouraged from being your in charge of your own life, you were meant to enter the system and be a good cog in the wheel. It didn't prepare you to to know 
and they actually discouraged you from remembering. So if you knew why you were here at between six and eight, the educational system was by and large designed to have you forget that and look at uh, how do I fit into this system, not why am I here, or how do I transcend that system? So now it's about remembering. And uh, by the way, my particular slant on that is that knowing why you're here and what that calls you to do is not just for the lucky few. So now we're talking about the science of it, that it's skill development. That knowing why you're here and being able to articulate that to anyone, anywhere, anytime, under any circumstance, and to be able to dance with our rapidly changing time, to be masterful and skillful in reinventing yourself as called for within the context of mission is a skill. So the format is inquiry and practice. So if you want to become an elite musician, there are, there are scales to do. If you want to become an elite athlete, there are practices that you do every day. If you want to become masterful at embodying your reason for being here, like any other skill development process, there are scales to do. So the scales are the, is the inquiry. And the practice would be, you know, what a lot of people call spiritual practice or presence practice or mindfulness practice, the practice. Inquiry and presence, inquiry and practice. And each domain has its practice and each tradition has its practice and each tradition also has its skill development. So in the way of life mission, you might say that there are, there's inquiry and practice. And if you do the practice, the promise is, you will absolutely be able to articulate to anyone anywhere under any circumstance why you hear what that calls you to do and who that calls you to be and how you actually manifest that in the world and how you dance with the times and how you do that artfully, beautifully, sacredly, and skillfully. So as skill development. So maybe at this point we could segue into um, this upcoming retreat that we're both going to be a part of, because I, I'm going to assume that this is some of the stuff you'll be touching on um, in your, uh, in the time that you'll be spending uh, teaching at this amazing event coming up, um, which is the WOW Retreat, Women of Wisdom. And uh, I've spoken about it in the past with some of the other guests. And so what are some of the ways, because it sounds to me like there are two important steps in what you just talked about. First of all, you have to remember, first of all, find that purpose, find that mission, right? Because until you figure that part out, you won't know what skills, what practices to take on in order to reinforce that mission. So what are some of those steps that people can take to figure that out and to help them remember and then once they have remembered, what does that training then look like? What does that skill development then look like? Now, obviously this is a, probably a much larger conversation, but maybe we could bring that down just to a couple points that could give people an idea of what they can expect should they work with you and what they can maybe expect um, as far as this retreat that's coming up. Well, as part of the conference, the people who are, who are there um, live and in Technicolor, so to speak, will be given a copy of the book Caravan of Remembering that I wrote. And the Caravan of Remembering, speaking of remembering, is uh, a book that's meant to demonstrate the process within a story so that you have an example of somebody working the process. The story is fictional. And it's, uh, it's a way of addressing the process of remembering why you're here and giving you the scales to do that. So um, one of the things I'll be sharing is some of the actual scales, like as an example of, for instance, what's the question at the center of your life? Uh, you look at your favorite books, movies, events, uh, sport, you know, sports, your favorite movies, your favorite characters, Yes, it's interesting to see what were your favorites. More importantly, though, is why. What does that say about who you are that, that, that for you, they're your favorites? And that's just hints and clues about your life mission. We could say, again, Rumi, if the beauty you love, Rumi said, let the beauty you love be what you do. If you let the beauty you love be what you do, what would you be doing? Um, if you could live for 300 years, what would you do with it? If you only had one year to live, what would you do with that? You know, when you go to a big box bookstore, which mostly we don't do in the moment, 
though some of them have reopened. Which section do you go to first? Which section do you go to second? Habitually, why do you always go to that place first? If you have every category of book, why do you go there first? Um, if you had 18 minutes to address the world, like the original TED stage, you had 18 minutes and there was only one TED stage and you were guaranteed that at least 100 million people would be watching. So you had 18 minutes to make your case to the world, to 100 million people anyway. If you had that opportunity to have 18 minutes to address the world, what would you do? So those, I mean, there are literally hundreds of those, I call them scales. And, and then to do the inquiry on a regular basis increases your skill level with being present to your life mission. And it's also that the answer doesn't come from one of those things. Your why, what, and who is an emergent principle. Like for instance, if you have 999,999 molecules of H2O, you still don't have water. H2O is not water until you have at least a million molecules and then this emergent thing we call water shows up. And your life mission is like that. So doing these scales is like being present to the movement towards the emergence of, ah, that's why I'm here. And that's what we're going to do because your life mission is never just about you. It's also something a lot of other people will be in. So it's also about more than you. So the, the emergent, here's why I'm here. Here's how we're here. Here's what we're going to do. Here's who I'm called to be. Here's how I'm called to show up. And here's how we will manifest this. That's the how part, right? So then the ongoing process of how you reinvent yourself is still part of that emergent thing. So thankfully, it's really actually not about figuring it out. You know, I talk about the difference between ra linear rational figuring something out and transrational knowing. So when you have that epiphany moment where you have an emergent knowing, no figuring is required. So the great thing about the skill practice is that you get to life mission because it's an emergent thing and there's no figuring required. It just, there's an emergent and that also goes with how do I reinvent myself? So, you know, there's a conversation for a compelling future that's part of the WOW conference and to engage in that compelling future is presence to your transrational knowing self and doing the, the skill practice of the inquiry, the presence practices inquiry and practice, right? So what we'll do at the, so in my slot in the conference, I'll be sharing some of the practices from the Caravan of Remembering, which is kind of that first level of life mission about why am I here? What does that call me to do? And who does that call me to become? We'll share some of the practices. We'll have a conversation, uh, maybe some, answer some of the questions about life mission. Like, what is that? You know, distinctions of vision, mission, and purpose. And what life mission is existential intelligence and lines of intelligence that, you know, those kinds of things. That sounds amazing. Um, something you mentioned about this idea of transrational knowing. Yeah. And to me, that just sounds like sometimes you have to get out of your own way to figure out who you are, right? Because there's the conscious self and conscious, because something I've studied quite a bit is flow states. And yeah. when we talk about flow states, there's this idea of hypofrontality, right? Where when you're in this incredible state of flow, which is ultimately a state of, you know, ultimate potential, um, science has shown us that we're actually turning off this part of our brains, which is the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for thought and language and all these things that we believe to be so important. But here we are in this ultimate state of potential and that part of us is turned off. And to me, that sounds a lot like what you're talking about, where we get out of, out of our own way, we turn that part off so we can be our best. So we can maybe tap into that collective consciousness and allow ourselves to emerge as the true self. Um, so anyway, sorry, I wanted to kind of just add no, that because great. I would say that the great thing it really triggered me that I love that term. I never heard it before. And so it's something I definitely latched onto. Yeah, I, the flow, flow state is definitely a way of talking about dropped in, click, Navy SEALs talked about clicked in. Yeah. Uh, the flow is another way of talking about that transrational knowing self. Yeah. Capital S self, we get it, you know. Um, and the great thing about that is when you get into that flow state, when you get into that transrational knowing state, you actually don't have to figure out 
who you are anymore. You remember who you are. Yeah. And, because and it's also like I've experienced it on the performance end, whether it be through sports, through yeah. martial arts and all that, but I've also experienced it through meditation. Right. Yeah. And I've kind of come at it from two angles and there's like during an action flow state, it's yeah. very much about that action and performing that action at my best. So there isn't as much room for self-exploration, but through meditation, you, that's where you get to really dive deep and to figure things out in a way that, like you said, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tap into if you were too busy figuring things out, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, the uh, figuring, the figuring things out is where we get into trouble because then yes. we have to bring that linear rational mind and yeah. the trans-rational knowing self has always already known how to do it. And I, you know, when I think about the flow in athletics or martial arts, that uh, if you drop out of figure, if you drop out of flow, you will go to figuring, and if you go to figuring, you're about to either if you're in if you're in a sport, you're about to screw up in the sport. Yeah. If you're in a martial art, you're about to not be skillful. Let's yes. say, <laughs> right? So uh, our our best place, our best self, our that that flow state, that dropped in transrational knowing place, is actually the only thing that has ever moved humanity forward. You know, we have a misperception that that high rational achiever mode is what's moved humanity forward, but it really hasn't. High rational achievers will, you know, sort of hit their head against the wall figuratively, you know, to try to solve a problem. And it'll just be like a certain amount of angst, a lot of figuring, figuring, figuring. And when it won't resolve, often it resolves in the moment when they're taking a shower or they've gone, they've gone for a bike ride or a jog or they've gone to their, you know, place on the lake or the, you know, like the moment where we let go and stop trying to figuring, stop trying to figure is when it drops in and we have that epiphany moment. And the only thing that has ever really moved us forward is the moments of transrational knowing epiphany moments where we've actually let go of our rational mind. And that's what's moved humanity forward. And you know, part of that scaling up with the future that wants to happen without figuring is the opportunity to have epiphany be more the rule and less the exception. Yeah way of looking at it. Yeah, I think it's a little bit easier said than done <laughs> for a lot of people, but I think that's where that's where these practices come in, right? Yeah. You won't, unfortunately, you don't get to create that type of change in your life without putting in the work. And, and I think that's that, the uh, inquiry in the practice. Yeah. You know, I, I was watching, and the reason I was watching a Natalie Portman masterclass on the, yeah. on the masterclass app. Yeah. The reason I was watching that is the question of performance, you know, like when you're can, you know, flow in performance. And I was what I watched like six episodes of her, here's training to be an actor, actor, actress. And the gist of it was, and why I was watching it was all of that pre work, all the background work, the backstory work, the all the work and getting ready to for cameras to roll was all so that you've done the work so that when cameras roll, you're in flow. Yeah. At that moment, you've done that work so you can forget all the figuring, all the supposed to, all the technique even, so that in that moment, as you would say, you're in flow. And I think you can use the exact same rationale for sport, right? Yeah. Because the, the great athlete is a combination of two things. It's one, having invested the work, because mm -hmm. no matter how much flow you're in, if you've never put on a pair of skis, you're not gonna fly down the mountain. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but if you put in the work and this is where a lot of athletes and performers fail is that they put in the work, but then they for, then they're not able to release. They're not able to allow flow to happen because they get caught up in their own linear way of thinking and they they think their way into a bad situation or they think their way into a bad performance. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I'm fascinated. I think it's such an important part of human performance and not only human performance, but also I think like what you said about how we need to move forward. And those great moments of moving forward will only happen because of flow, because of transrational knowing. And so, um, yeah. So Daniel, thank you so much for, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Um, I think we explored some really interesting concepts. I think that people will learn a lot from you at this upcoming retreat. You also mentioned your book. So maybe to close, if you could just, um, just let us know where we can connect with you. And obviously I'll include all of these links and everything else in the notes for this episode. 
Sure, the book is called The Caravan of Remembering, and there's a website called, the, you know, you, you could go to the caravanofremembering.com.org like that. There's also a caravanconversations.community where you could, you could go to find a community of people to work the process work, you know, from wherever you are, um, could be anywhere in the world, and you could connect to other people through a Zoom call like this and work the process. Um, you, you could also connect to me through the Way of the Heart. That's where we do the courses through thewayoftheheart.com. Um, the, the book, The Caravan and Remembering, is available to, you know, through Amazon.com in the hard copy and also the Kobo, e, the ebook version on Kobo and iTunes and um, let's see, where Kindle and uh, yeah, Kindle, Nook, iTunes, all of those, right? So you can get that there too. So lots of ways we can connect with you, basically. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks again for taking the time and I look forward to seeing you at the conference and learning more from you because I, I think it'll be, uh, I think something that people will really benefit from quite a bit. Well, thank you for having me on. I enjoyed it.